right. You're tuned to Valley Free Radio 103.3 FM. I am the Viking Woman. And to my right is my co-host. Bunny. Yeah. I love Bunny. But tonight we have a special guest. And I'm going to have my guest introduce himself. Uh, can you state your name and what you do for a living? Hey, um, my name is Gian Hughes. I'm from Los Angeles. Uh, I do content creation, among a bunch of other things. But that's the main thing I'm on here for is a... Uh, making content, telling stories, just uh, get, getting my, some of my wisdom out of uh, living in LA and, and uh, going out and partying in LA, going to clubs, seeing bands uh, in the punk and goth and different uh, alternative scenes that we have here. Right. We managed to look out and we had a, we just happened to know one person and, and thankfully this person got us connected because I'm going to be in LA this weekend. And this, uh, I, I want to make sure I got your your first name pronounced correctly is G. How do you pronounce it again? Uh, Gion. 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 Yeah. But you can just go by G. I mean, I, yeah, it's really hard. Uh, it's, it's not like, hard. Like, uh, yeah, it's a French name. So in America, you know, we don't we get used to it that much. <clears throat> Gion. No, it's a yeah. cool name. I like it. I mean, my I friend. like it. Yeah, yeah thanks. So um, we, we do have a, a few things we, we want to discuss. But first of all, um, the first thing I want to talk about with you is uh, the LA scene in itself. Uh, I'm going to be there in two days and I'm very, very excited. What, when I spoke with a few people about the LA scene, most people think it does not exist. The goth backslash occult uh, subculture, people don't even think it exists anymore. And that is not true. What can you tell my audience right now about the goth LA scene? And what what kind of expectations they should have if they ever go to LA, uh, or how how do they find this? How do they find this subculture? Yeah, Los well, I mean, uh, yeah, the uh, I think it's a uh, um, you know you can go to Facebook or the social media and you can find different things about it. Uh, I think what the confusion is 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 uh you know they're they're really it all kind of melded together. You know the punk scene you know kind of became the goth scene, uh, became the death rock scene, and then then the thing and. Then there was also always the uh, industrial noise, you know, those kind of scenes that, and all those, we, we have all these individual scenes still today, but a lot of times they're not, they're not broadcast as much. I mean, I think a lot of people know like Bar Sinister uh, is, is really popular and, and that's, they consider that like is the whole goth scene. And we consider that more of like kind of a, kind of like a, a, a tourist place or a newcomer place, you know, and, right. uh, you know, we look for the, the, the more, I think a lot of it is, you know, too, is people know each other. They know the DJs. They know the security or the, the club runners. So, mm -hmm. so they're really like in the, in the know with that. Uh, I don't think it's, a, you know, people don't really advertise that much or any of that. You know, they, they don't put things on TV or anything. So, you know, a lot of times we want our clubs to be private. Uh, a lot of times even we have after hours clubs and stuff that we don't want any attention or people, of you know, course. trying to call people on or something uh, or, or even, you know, even modernly, I think uh, another reason that we kind of try to keep it on the DL is, uh, you know, modernly, there's a lot of uh, on social media, somebody could just come along and just do a reaction thing to, to your thing. You know, like if you do a video in the club, or, you know, something horrible happened in that club, they'll say and maybe it really didn't. But if somebody's, you know, loudly saying that it did, then people may assume that. So there's, there's a reaction culture that we're trying to, you know, kind of avoid modernly. But I think always there's always been kind of an underground element because that's just like how how, you know, L.A. is uh, and. Right. It is a little percent, you know, uh, I guess, you know, it, it would be uh, some people might think that it's uh, uh, a little bit like elitist or something. But I, I think that the main thing is they don't want people coming because, you know, sometimes celebrities come to these clubs and stuff. They don't want people just coming in and, you know, just uh, harassing people or just oh, going there that they're, they're normals and they want to just go and fetishize on, on goth girls or something. We don't really want that kind of stuff. So we don't necessarily uh, advertise that much. So people think that we're not we're not, it's not that big, but there is a huge scene of all the all the different uh, subcultures and I go out all you know I go out all the time I've been started going out when I was 13 and I'm um, still 53 you know I'm 53 still going out so, <laughs> so right. it's almost 40 years you know of that time and you know I, 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 people you know they go in and they go out because I had to raise kids so I I, I you know I, I went in I went out I, I you know had to only go once in a while but you know I, I do have a core uh, group of friends that I call and say let's go to this place because it reminds me of the old days so Right. It's very much still alive. It's just, like I said, it's a little bit underground and that's kind of how we want it, you know, to a certain yes. degree. I, I actually do appreciate the fact that this subculture has gone underground. And for me, and I'm, I'm actually glad I got this invite from you because otherwise I wouldn't even know it exists. A lot of people don't even know it exists anymore. 
So mm -hmm. this is this is a good thing that this is now being, uh, at least in my community here in Northampton, Massachusetts, uh, my listeners will at least appreciate that if they ever go down to Southern California, there is something for them, which is great. Um, yeah. So I'm going to steer to it the, in the next direction is basically I want my audience to get to know you a little bit better. And I know uh, you want to talk about a little bit of your childhood. Uh, you had a very interesting uh, beginning, as you would say. Um, yeah. Something about how you were born in an army hospital. Wow. Yes. So you would like yeah. to talk about Sure. Um, well, yeah. So, so yeah, I was, uh, my dad was actually in, a um, in Vietnam. He got drafted, uh, when he was 17 and, uh, my mom was like his high school sweetheart uh, and she would rode him the whole time there and was crying and so upset that, you know, cause he was literally getting shot at and he, he got some purple hearts too. You know, he got, he got shot in the head with a dart from, a from, a you know, we would call like maybe a native, uh, but they called him mountain yards. They were like, right. like in apocalypse now. So he got, he got shot in the head with a dart. He, he fell out of a, a helicopter and broke all his teeth out on his the end of his rifle so he got oh my god <laughs> oh my god my buddy happening. fell out of a helicopter in afghanistan it's not fun no yeah 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 well he, he told me stories that, that they, he got pushed out of a helicopter one time and like into a rice paddy uh you know because it didn't hurt him but he was like chest deep in his rice paddy water you know so so he was going through a lot of you know obviously going through a lot of hard stuff and then he got rest and relaxation you know the R and R. You know the, the lead from the from directly from the battlefield, and uh, he met with my mom. And then, you know he, back then it wasn't supposed to happen or whatever, but they weren't married yet. But she got pregnant because uh, they were in Hawaii. You know he he used his, his money from that to Hawaii, and and then uh, uh so then uh you know she was pregnant, and he you know they, they kind of let him go. He didn't do another tour. Uh, he was drafted. He didn't really want to go anyway because you know he, he didn't. It wasn't his choice. He served. He, he had to or whatever. Sure. Uh, and he came back to Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, and he was training, uh, uh, he was training uh, the, the uh, Rangers, you know, he, he'd be the guy that jumped out, like pretending to be an enemy for the uh, army Rangers and stuff like that. Right. And, uh, and during that time, that's, I was born there, but, but both my mom and my dad were, were from Southern California. They, they were, they were, you know, uh, raised, born and raised in Southern California. Well, my dad was born in West Virginia, but he'd been there for at least uh, uh, 10 years. And my mom was pretty much born there and, and raised. So, uh, um, so, so, so yeah, that was the, uh, uh, the thing. So, I was born there. It was really chaotic. Uh, you know, the army hospital, I was a breech birth. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, back then that they didn't do cesarean so much. Uh, right. it wasn't, a, you know, it was 1969 when I was born. So, you know, my mom almost died. I almost died as a baby. And so that, that started kind of like this chaotic thing. I think, you know, I've always had a thing with chaos around me trying to manage and, and, uh, and, and bring chaos to order around me. And the birth was, you know, was like that. And, uh, you know, also another thing that, that, that after I researched it, uh, when when babies are born breech, they, they have a certain thing, a sacred clown. They call it a, a, a hayoka. It's like a Native American thing. Oh, right. sorry. My... <laughs> oh, but, uh, yeah, yeah. She's, she's, she's freaking out. I was trying to put her to bed. But yeah, so so this this uh, this thing with the sacred clown is when people are, were born breech in the Native American cultures and stuff, they would say that you know that they have this certain talent of a, a, a in late, uh, modernly we call it implant uh, you know impasse hayoka implants but hayoka actually is a term that comes from the Sioux Native American tribe that that's saying sacred clown and everything they do everything backwards and I was also as a child like uh, diagnosed with uh, um, with dyslexia and stuff like that because I would write and read backwards but I do it really good <laughs> it's <always backwards>. right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so that you know that led to, uh, uh, to you know a lot I had a pretty chaotic childhood um you know and uh it actually led to me uh having to live with my grandparents uh right and uh so that's when uh I, I you know my grandfather died in front of me and that brought that brought a whole thing of the occult and thing that was when I was seven years old in 1977 so there's like some numbers numerology behind that too right. you know and so um so yeah it, it, you know that that kind of led me to the occult you know, uh, and to and to these alternative type scenes like punk and and uh, uh and you know goth and those kind of things. But at first, it was just punk, pretty much. Right. I'm going to actually sit, chime in for a second. Uh, one thing I remember when I was in Arizona, I went through the the Navajo, um, and I ended up picking up this. Uh, I, when you go to a gift shop, sometimes you gravitate to like an object, and the one I ended up gravitating to was a Navajo clown. 
And uh, I ended up buying it. In fact, I had it on my purse for like many years until it got lost in Disney World in Florida this uh, earlier this year, which I was very sad to lose. But uh, but he was but this one was Navajo. And when I was ready to go fly back home to Massachusetts, I was remember I was sitting in the bus and I had the the Navajo clown, but it was like a young blue Indian uh, Native American brave. He was color blue with his feathers uh, traditional, but he was young. He looked like he was 17 or 18 and he passed right through me in a bus. And I was like, what just just happened? So it's kind of cool that like me and you, we can talk about these things about like paranormal experiences, uh, that cannot be explained away, but at least for us, it feels real. And for anybody, my listeners that are listening to it, uh, like with you, 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 uh, you were able to relate to the one, uh, the Cherokee, uh, the Cherokee, uh, uh, what they call it, the uh, sacred clown. And yeah, like, yeah. I, I had the sacred clown pass through me, but mine was Navajo. Yeah. Well, I was actually raised with a, a Navajo family here in LA too. I mean, they were, uh, they were, the mother was from the reservation uh, and, and being Navajo, uh, the father was Mexican. So they were kind of a mixed, you know, mixed between the two. So I know a lot about the Navajo. Uh, um, I mean, were they I, Diné? I, were they Diné? Yeah, they called D- Diné as the actual name. It's funny that the 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 which I don't know, you know, how much this is in history because you know a lot of the Native American history and stuff is lost and, and skewed. But Navajo, because you know Nava uh, uh, in Spanish, Nava means knife, you know, mm-hmm. knife. And so so it's it's almost like they're calling them the knife raiders, you know, <laughs> the, the, right. the Spanish because it. And then I think the whole part, you know, it comes from like people thinking that. That, that Native Americans, they, they, when they when they greet you, the language is all the same, which it isn't, obviously, right? But right. they would say how when they were friendly, and then they would say ho, you know, like trying to scare you if they were if they were like not friendly. So it would be like nah, but like like knife scarers, knife raiders, you know. So they, so, so that's the, the real name they call is Diné. Is Diné is, is is their language, and and they they actually uh, you know that that particular tribe and 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 the the Hopi and the Zuni in there, they actually preserved a lot of their culture because they didn't have to go through the Trail of Tears with all the East right. Coast, and, and you know, and and I'm from Oklahoma too, so I have a native connection there too. Uh, uh, with 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 uh, you know, because that that was Indian territory they used to call it, and yes. that was supposed all the whole state was supposed to be for natives, and then you know it didn't work out that way anyway. No. You know? So so yeah, so that's the that's the uh, uh, I, I've had a lot of Native American background, and and I know about the shamanism and the spirituality of that also, and. And you know, if if, if, it, if things get too crazy in the cities, I, I run to the reservation and I got a trailer on my my, my friend's thing and just disappear, you know, because <laughs> you know, I think you can get especially now with COVID and all that. I mean, I was I was gone most of the time in those those areas, you know, just in the middle of nowhere, just driving my Subaru around. <laughs> well, you at least you have places to go and people that you know where if you feel like you need to break away from the city. You have like a, a, I hate using the word safe space, but <laughs> you have a place to go. How about that? Yeah, yeah, a getaway. Uh, <laughs> what places like those are good to be creative too? Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Now I, a big one of mine too is going to, to Desert Hot Springs. That's like a good getaway. There's not many people. It's a, it's in a high desert here in California, and uh, it's not that expensive because it's like you know it's it's just not developed that much yet. So you could stay at the hot tub place for like $70 a night. I'm just, <laughs> it's fine for me. Not bad. Yeah. No. Sometimes I want to just get, I, LA just gets a little bit uh, too much uh, with all, with all this stuff going on sometimes for me, but, and I, and I'm used to it. <laughs> Are you talking about the hot springs in Hesperia, California? Uh, well, the, the one I'm actually talking about is, is in, it's called desert hot springs. It's close to, to, to Joshua tree and Coachella and all those places. Uh, I might have one. been to those. I did go out to some hot springs in between LA and Las Vegas. Yeah, th- there's tons of them all over. Uh, uh, all over uh, uh, when you're go- going on that route and uh, just the old ghost towns. Most most places that had any water at all, they built a little ghost town around it. Or or now it's a ghost town. They built a settlement and it turned into a ghost town now because people, you know, didn't uh, right. you know it didn't out <laughs> with the with the gold and everything. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next thing I'm going to ask is um we're one of the talking points we wanted to uh, go over is your initiation to necromancy uh i think it started when you were at the age of seven starting with the death of your grandfather and then you kind of went into the connection with star wars k2 
chaos magic jedi and sith which uh you know the back and forth of order versus chaos and then later on you got into martial arts your army training and then you started talking about uh, the alternate night the modern night today uh, along with the pop culture the new mythology of the gods so i'm just curious what uh what you may want to add to yeah, yeah that's, that's seven. That, you know it turned out in, in 1977 so my, my, my mom and dad didn't get along that well you know I mean, mostly probably because my dad got severe ptsd from the war you know and, and he was just coming from the war it wasn't like it was 20 years ago it was it was like five years ago right or something here i mean when i was when i was born basically ever since i was born he had that on his mind or whatever so so you know i lived with my grandparents and then um and as i you know my grandfather was only 55 years old and uh, i was the day after his birthday and it was in 1977 and i was seven and yeah, he just, he had a major uh, uh, aneurysm and his, his, his aorta burst and like, he just died, you know, and I didn't even know people really died or I thought it was in the movies or stuff like that. So, so we, but when he died, you know, I was right there and it was, he, I was in, you know, he's right in front of me. So this, his spirit kind of came through me. I could feel, I could feel that there was something more. It wasn't just that you die and you go out, you know? Right. Um. So what happened was, you know, you know, you know, there there wasn't a lot of therapy back in nineteen the seventies, and I also I also you know, the uh, they didn't put me in therapy or anything, and nobody went to therapy. But anyway, uh, so my grandfather like started coming back when I was like ready to go to sleep, which which I later found out that's because uh you know we go into a, a brain state that's a, that's like a theta brain state that we're more receptive to seeing things or or even uh manifesting things that we see in our minds or whatever you know uh right. so my grandfather coming back when I was trying to uh. uh go to sleep as a child and uh like you first I would just scream and go crazy you know because I mean it's a dead, dead grandfather and he looks different you know he looks a little just more disheveled and stuff that the image that I saw of him uh the thing is is uh is you know he started like saying don't scream don't don't scream don't tell people you're seeing me things like that you know using intelligence kind of telling me these things and that I wouldn't come up with on my own so like I I knew that it was like I knew that it was like uh um probably that just in my head because I was just a little kid and I would just wanted to scream and he was telling me not to scream and don't tell people that I, you see me because you, you know you go to a hospital and all that stuff so so it, then eventually I got used to talking to him and he brought in other spirits and I, I got this big that was what I consider the uh, you know initiation and necromancy kind of right because he is a d disembodied being and he's bringing other disembodied beings or some kind of beings that they're telling me all this stuff you know and right, and then right around 1977 is when Star Wars came out so I saw that in the theaters and uh, I, you know, I, they, you, uh, I don't know. I think the second one was mostly where they showed where the, they had a ghostly figure of Obi Wan Kenobi or whatever. But they showed Obi Wan Kenobi how he he died and there there, there was nothing left. And right. then then he talking about how, uh, you know, I always thought that you know, you you don't see things. You know, you don't see like where you're moving and stuff. So if someone does like like you know do something, you just move automatically. That that's like you know how they said where the guy put his blinders on with the Star Wars. So. I was really feeding into Star Wars almost like it was like some kind of like uh, religious training or something because I was right. kind of out of it because of my, my grandfather, you know, and I, you know, that led to me getting into martial arts more and like the stuff that you mentioned. Uh, then later I, I joined the army myself. My dad wanted me to. It, it didn't work out that well for me. And there wasn't any wars then. So, you know, this is like in 1989. Uh, right, there was so, nothing going on. So it was a cold war, but but the, but right. I still had very interesting uh, uh, interactions with their, their new training and stuff like that. And and you know that, that's a whole thing for another time, but uh, right. but yeah, that's, that's you know the, I think I, the the thing with Star Wars and why I say you know the modern mythology is is the movies are our mythology that they're, they're our pantheon. People don't realize that, but you know that's what's become our 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 thing is the movies. You know, uh, just like in the old Greek or Roman, you know they would have Zeus and they, they'd have a storyteller tell you all about Zeus and all the goddesses and all that stuff. Now we have movies, and you know, we've been seeing it moving in with Thor and. And the different the different gods. Now the last Thor, they had Zeus in in Thor, right? You know, which <laughs> so like the, you see it coming in. Uh, I think that's that's my main thing with the cult is is you know people a cult just means hidden, and we hide from maybe it's just supposed to be that way. We hide like our 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 cult from us, you know, like we don't want to think that movies are magic and movies are our new religion, but right. they kind of are, you know. <laughs> right, right. No, that's uh, yeah, you brought. So that's the problem with that. I mean, I, I I'm trying to. You know, I, I try to, I'm doing, I do videos about these things and I try to get people to, to realize that, you know, finding their truth or, or, or their, you know, uh, meaning of life is, you mm -hmm. know, looking around you and saying, oh, well, this, 
you know, in in a hundred years, they're going to say that that these movies were a cult. You know, we're we're we're, right. we're a cult, whatever. You know, <laughs> so like you know, no, this is cool. All right. Yeah. Um, what we'll do next is um, let me see what the time is. Uh, I think we got a few more minutes, and we could talk another talking point before we. Uh, I I wish I had a better Zoom connection because I have to do two of them tonight. Uh, let's see. Okay, we're gonna talk about your time when you started the going into the punk scene, and then later on how you transitioned from the punk scene going into the death rock scene when you were a young, well, you were a teenager at the time. So I'll have you start your story from there. Okay. Um. So yeah. So in in the early eighties, uh, you know, I I was I, I would actually the before I went to any shows, I went to a Knott's Berry Farm. They had this place called Studio K and uh, Cloud Nine, and those you know that was a which now we think of as eighties or alternative maybe, but that was what the music was coming out like the the Cure, you know, mm -hmm. the Smith. Those were that was like that was pop pop music for us basically. You know, uh, now we look at it as retro in the eighties and all that. Yeah. And, in the 80s that was the the music so we would dance a little bit like that so then we got together we got our courage up a little bit because they were very young you know like like 14 13 14 uh when we were i mean it was before i could drive we, we we like all got our courage up and went to our first punk show which is at the palladium in hollywood you know uh and i saw the toy dolls uh, i think the dickies opened up for them uh there was there was like it, it was a good show it was a good fun show like you know uh and they were they were kind of jokey bands, you know, so they weren't hardcore like like, you know, bands that, that, that we were afraid of because we were, we were young, you know. So after that, we went to Fender's Ballroom and saw uh, Social Distortion and bands like that. So we got a little bit more hardcore, got a little bit used to like uh, and that, that's that's almost basically I think that's kind of a martial arts kind of, you know, training is to go into the pit and learn how to get knocked, knocked, knocked down. And, you know, it's almost like, you know, you could survive a riot if you've done a lot of uh we're, you know, a lot of uh, going to the pit and slant and, and all the different things because people just come and shove you and you got to make sure you're not going to just fall down. And so it's, there's a lot, there's a lot of dynamics there too that they feed into martial arts, I believe, you know? Uh, so the thing is, is, is they, the whole scene kind of got infested with gangs, you know? And uh, so at the, in the eighties, you know, they had uh, the skinheads, which yes. was more Caucasian gang. Uh, there were, there was more, you know, a lot of them were, some of them were just, you know, they, they were okay. They, they, they weren't, you know incredibly racist and some of them were you know but but like you know because you know the, the music actually comes from like jamaican ska and stuff like that so you know there were some you know so but but they fought each other too because they had the jamaican ska type of uh black skin right. or, or black skin heads or or people that, that liked that, that that thing and then they had the, the, the you know the the national front or american front you know these gangs that really wanted to like they were white supremacist gangs essentially so i kind of joined one called the suicidals but after suicidal tendencies and yes. uh we got, you know, so we started, uh, you know, having a little bit of scuffles with that. But we was, you know, I wasn't a tough guy. I didn't want to be a gangster and I, I didn't have nothing to prove. So we all got together and we realized that, you know, people were, you know, getting shot in the parking lot, getting, getting you know, people sneaking in weapons, trying to stab people in the pit. And, you know, fights were breaking out. People were getting beat up. So we were like, you know, and, and women started to stop showing up, you know. So right. There was the ratio like, from women to men, like, dropped significantly and it became a sausage fest. <laughs> I would argue, yeah. <laughs> wah, wah. I, would argue, I would argue that they were smarter than than those guys, but you know, but because that's how because I, I like to get on women's good side. But yeah, they obviously they don't want there were a few women who wanted to go and see people get shot, beat up, bloodied in a pit, all you know. So so that's that's when we said, you know, th there was a scene, they were just called death rockers, though, not really goth so much. I guess I don't know if that term even existed that much back in the 80s. Uh here in my scenes at least. There was nobody in my city of Downey uh, in that scene that, that was into that that much uh, other than one, like two other guys that I know, two other people, uh, maybe three, uh, three people that I knew. So we all got together and started going to these other clubs. Uh, the first club I went to was called Scream. And we started seeing, you know, bands like Christian Death and things like that. And, and it was a lot more mellow. And yeah. so there was like, you know, we we uh, eventually went to, you know, where we go to industrial shows. So like like the Sudamore and Das Bunker. That was yeah. like that was started in the 90s, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, there were also shows that that uh, uh, that the industrial scene did that the chaos magic came into, and we could go into those later and stuff. But but yeah, that was the main thing was yeah that that that, that for us that you know we wanted to I mean I guess those guys wanted to keep showing up to the show who was the toughest or you know you know uh, 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 something like that. But that wasn't for us. We wanted to go you know just socialize and talk to people and and peacefully have fun. And it was you know you still have to have your guard up. I think everywhere you still have to have your guard up. You know you got to watch your drinks wherever you go. I mean the no matter if they have a, 
uh, 50 bouncers. They can't control somebody maybe sneaking something in your drink or singling you out, you know, shadow shadowing you. That's why it's good to go in groups. It's good to, you know, have a, have a general safety. And me and my sons, we, we, we teach that. I mean, myself from the thing and my sons are into security and stuff. My son's in the army right now, even. So we're, we're you know, we're, we're try, we try to get people uh, and do videos and, and, and even, you know, do a uh, live education about, you know, just you, you have your awareness. Know that, you know, that, that you may have to use an improvised weapon. You know, you may have to use your build, right. beer bottle, match somebody with it. You don't want to, you don't, you know, I don't recommend that. But if somebody's really coming at you, you know, right. to think bouncers or, or, or security or even police are going to help you in an underground club, it's not going to happen. Right. You're probably going to get thrown out. And then the, whoever's bothering you is going to like find you outside or, mm -hmm. and they'll just it's going to be like, you're, you're a problem, you know? <laughs> right, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, just to let you know, I'm trying to see how much time we got left. I think we got like maybe a little bit more than five minutes. Um, so just in case we get, uh, cause probably what I'm going to do is like, after this point, I'll probably have, um, we'll just finish the interview like at 20 of and play some music. And then I got to start the next one with, uh, the next interview, which is a pre-recorded, uh, you probably know who I'm talking about. Uh, Adam yeah. Percipio. Uh -huh. I'm going to be doing an interview with, um, going to be playing his interview afterwards at the top of the next hour. Uh, but, but before we go, uh, you have a very funny story with uh, with a, a musician that everybody knows. Uh, his name is Billy Idol. So uh, you want to tell everybody about the, your um, your story about yeah. him? Yeah, for sure. Um, so he's going to like this one. <laughs> Last night, a little dancer came dancing to my door. <laughs> yeah, well. You know, so so I, I was talking about how we, we kind of get this instinctual way of, of surviving in the in the slam pits and stuff like that. And I was and I would go to the the, the, the punk rock shows with these this, these Navajo brothers that I that I was raised with, you know. And so we had this joke technique, you know. We, they don't even have buffalo in the, with the Navajo, but they, they have sheep. But but you know, because they were native, we would joke and say, you know, the buffalo technique. We just throw our elbow up, you know, right away, you know, like just throw an elbow up, like instinctively when someone was coming at you. You know, even full force, they're gonna hit your elbow. That's they're, they're gonna get hurt. I mean, and you're not hitting them; they're hitting you. So you know, so so we call that the the the, the buffalo technique. You know, that okay. we throw our elbow up, and and you know, and I still use that today if I'm in the right thing. <laughs> so 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 you know, I went to the show. This is in the, the early '90s, and uh, uh, my friend was playing there, Jacob Cavalier. His name, band was called the Gonuts. Billy showed up with an entourage, and it was cool. You know, we were, and then for a while we were we were pogoing and slamming. And, you know, it was it was epic. We were slamming and pogoing with Billy Idol and it, and a guy from the Stray Cats, and I think there was a guy from the Fuzz Stones there. It was it was like a celebrity thing. So so oh, that was wow. fun. But then Billy took over the stage and uh, started singing. You know, and I didn't like it. He took over my friends' bands on the stage. Maybe they liked it. I don't know. But he started singing. He started goofing on Elvis, like a like a Andy Kaufman or something, right? And we thought, yeah, it's kind of silly. So we started goofing on him and doing. You know, we were, we were like, eyes without a face. You know, we started doing the lip. You remember the lip he had? With the yes. <laughs> <laughs> So then his entourage is like, leave Billy alone. He's cool. This and that, right? And so we got to do a little scuffle with the, the entourage because they, they came up and, and, and they put our hand, their hands on us. They were like, you know, right. put those hands. Because we were doing the, the rebel, you know, with the, the, the arm up. And they were like, push your hands down. We're like, hey, you put our, your hands on us. So we got a little scuffle. Billy jumps off the stage and he's going to like solve this with his star power, right? And he, he comes running up. What the hell's going on, all right? And then I instinctively just threw the elbow, right? <laughs> <laughs> He gets hit in the head. He's like, "Oh my head, hair, right? you know." I mean, he probably use some, ex, ex, yeah, some bad words that we probably can't say. But he's like, "Me bleeding head," uh. and then I think I, I, I mentioned that uh, I thought he was a has been fashion punk and he should go back to England. <laughs> and I got kicked out of the club, but <laughs> but it was worth it, I think. Right? Oh my god, that's hilarious! Two ninety three. It was at a place called the White Horse, and. Uh, <laughs> This guy yeah. elbow Billy Idol. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. No, these are like these. I love these stories. I mean, so many people have great stories to tell. Say your prayers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, um, I, I'm really glad that we got a chance to meet. Now, Bunny, uh, luckily, got a chance to talk with you a little bit, but I'm gonna be with G um, I keep forgetting. They never get to pronounce it a G. I, it's yeah, G spot. Gion. Gion. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm very lucky that, uh, like I said, I have to thank Adam Percipio to getting us connected. 
uh, along with uh, some of the other uh, groups that you're affiliated with. Like, I think you're affiliated with the uh, YouTube channel, uh, Dark Sorcery. Yeah, I do podcasts there. And I have my own, I have my own channel, Guillotine Productions. Okay, so give a shout out to your your little um, your little company and also with Dark uh, Dark Sorcery because uh, I'm still getting familiar with those guys also. Yeah, yeah. Well, on mine, I'm I'm going to start a whole thing, you know, kind of like doing doing things uh, about different people I know in LA and everybody just telling their story because you know just like I'm trying to tell my story. There's a lot of different stories, and I think that people will get a lot of not just be entertained but get wisdom uh uh to, to to start their own scenes or or how to act in whatever scene there are not to be nervous to go out uh that's that's gonna be my goal i think alfredo is dark saucery he's he's, he's been doing the occult uh, podcast forever that's i got adam into that and that's why adam you know uh, uh as a as a uh, yes. networking courtesy he's, he said hey i have to, to you guys to, 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 to so i met you guys through that because i helped adam get on that show and uh so we're just trying to do different shows networking and uh and get big but uh yes uh you know, it's, it's scary to get big too because there's a lot of uh, a lot of these reactions to culture, like I was saying, and people, you know, a lot of creeps come out, even for men, <laughs> even for big, scary looking men like me. But you know, still creeps come out and and, and uh, stalkers and all kinds of stuff that uh, that's just oh, not that I, fun. <laughs> it's gonna be interesting. Like when I do, when I when I finally land in uh, Los Angeles, this is gonna be my first time in 30 years being in that city. So mm. I'm, I'm, it's the first time I was there was culture shock. Yeah. Um, it was big culture shock for me, but also I think the second time since the city has changed so much, since there's now a larger uh, Latino population, along with some of the problems in that city, uh, it's uh, unfortunately it's it's not in its uh, prime right now. So but yeah, I'm not afraid. I mean, you basically well, told no, you'll, you'll see, and, and you've got and, and I go out all the time, and you know uh, you, you do have to have like a taser, pepper spray. I mean, you know, I, I don't have to use it usually, but you know, the taser thing makes people back off usually, but you know. Yeah, people that come up for change, a lot of, you know, panhandlers, oh. dangerous, you know? Yeah. Right. Okay, we're almost out of time here because this is when the Zoom connection, like, cuts off. So I want to have <laughs> you say your goodbyes. And okay. I'm going to call you on your phone once I get off here, and I'm going to play some music after this. But thank you for being on Valley Free Radio, my program, Dark Wave, with myself and my co-host. Bunny. And uh, I'll be in touch in a, in a few seconds. But uh, I think the next song I'm going to be playing, I'm going to be playing a track by Sidewalks and Skeletons, one of your favorite bands that you uh, introduced me to. So mm, thank, thank you very much. I hope I can be back. <laughs> you will be. You're, you're, fun, yeah. you're a fun individual and your your, levi your levity is much, much wanted. <laughs> yeah, that was a cool Billy Idol story. Yes. Yeah, I had a great time. I, I hope we do more of these. All right. Uh, we'll be okay. back. Okay, so we're going to be playing some music right now and we'll be back uh, shortly.